So today, what I will be going over in my portion of this video is restriction endonucleases, restriction enzymes, specifically that of e 5, in addition to the mechanism behind protein shuttling. So with here, we will start with protein shuttles. And this is specifically having to do with carbonic anhydrase, which is discussed later within this video in the mechanism with that enzyme. But here, um, what is meant to be shown by protein shuttling is that buffer molecules are unable to enter the active site of an enzyme because of their size. They are too big to enter the active site. And so in carbonic anhydrase, active site protein shuttles occur. So as you can see here in the diagram, histine 64 is a residue in the active site which is able to grab this proton and can therefore shuttle it to the surface of the active site. So therefore, this buffer, as shown with the letter B, is able to then be able to pick up that proton and the protein transfer of the zinc to bound um, water here is able to with with the buffer is able to increase the hydration rate of CO2, which will again be explained later. So now I can move on to restriction endonucleases and restriction enzymes, specifically with E. core 5, which is from E. coli and has been studied before previously. But E core 5 has an active site that includes magnesium ion as well as three water ligands and aspartic acid residues. And it's able to cleave the DNA with um, these restriction enzymes, which can later be then stitched together with DNA ligases. So here is the recognition site for E core 5, which can be seen in this first palindromic sequence on the left. And this is also known as the cognate DNA. And this is the DNA that is recognized, whereas over here, this is what is not recognized and also called the non-cognate DNA. So E. core 5 does not cleave the host DNA, otherwise known as this non-cognate DNA. Um, and it only actually cleaves this foreign DNA um, as the um, DNA, the host DNA, has these adenines as shown with this asterisk here that are methylated, but um, this cognate DNA can be cleaved and that's so that the viral DNA can be recognized so that um, the host Genome is able to be protected um, from viral infection. So now learning what occurs in the actual chemistry of E. 5 and in the active site, um, the phosphodiester bond here, as shown with this pink squiggly line here, is what is cleaved. And this will give up the free three prime hydroxyl and the five prime and which is uh, attached to the phosphoryl group. And to find out what mechanism occurs in uh, this restriction nuclea endonuclease um, cleavage of DNA, there are two different mechanism possibilities that we look at. And so the first mechanism here is that um, with covalent intermediate, and it's like that of chimerotrypsin. And here, an enzyme has a nucleophilic side chain, as shown right here. E is representing um, an enzyme, and this can attack the phosphorus, which allows for the um, enzyme phosphorus intermediate here. And then water is able to come in and act as a nucleophile to be able to reestablish the active site of the enzyme um, kicking out this enzyme with the nucleophilic side chain. Um, and the second option for possible mechanisms that can occur is through direct hydrolysis. And that this is similar to that of carbonic anhydrase. So you have water 
in the active site, which can then directly attack this phosphorus right here. And this is in a single step, which is able to form um, like this complex here where the phosphorus oxygen bond has been cleaved. So in order to find out which two of these possible mechanisms occurs with restriction enzymes, um, we also have to note that with SN2 attacks and SN2 mechanisms, if a nucleophil right here um, attacks to give a um, complex in a single step, it attacks from the backside and then kicks out the leaving group. So here we are showing a phosphorus, a chiral phosphorus, kicking out a ligand with a nucleophile attacking a backside attack. And it's important to note that this causes a stereochemical inversion into the product. <clears throat> but this only occurs with um, molecules that have chiral centers. And as we saw with equor 5 above, there is not a chiral center with this phosphorus as it has more than one of oxygens bound to it. Um, but synthetic molecules were able to be made where um, one of the oxygens here would be replaced with something else such as a uh, sulfur. And then they were able to create a chiral center in lab. And this led to an understanding that what actually occurs with restriction endonucleases is what happens in direct hydrolysis in uh, the second mechanism that we went over with the, um, because of the inversion of stereochemistry at the phosphorus atom, um, where the water is activated by a metal ion like that in e 5, where I mentioned that there's a uh, magnesium ion. So then if no inversion is noticed, then that is what occurs in the, first mechanism. So the it's also important to note that with ECOR5, just some side notes that the AT sequence here is important because it's able to allow for easier distortion so that when the DNA is bound, it can cause a kink. And these uh, five prime terminal Gs and Cs are also important in the recognition site for um, hydrogen bonding in order to communicate with the active site, um, communicate upstream that the kinking is allowed so that therefore the cognate DNA is able to bind to the active site and then can therefore be cleaved. Okay, so now we're going to talk about carbonic anhydrase, which is an enzyme used in order to accelerate the hydration of carbon dioxide by activating water. This is extremely important in the bicarbonate buffer system and is used to regulate pH within the body. So to begin, we have here the uh, active site of the carbonic anhydrase, which is a zinc two plus ion bound to three histidines. This is also bound to a water molecule as well. To begin, the first step is the hydroxide ion generation. So we have the loss of a proton, or an H+, plus, and this generates a hydroxide ion or an oxygen with a negative charge bound to a hydrogen. This is again bound to that zinc ion here and three histidines. The zinc ion and the histidines create a stabilization of the negative charges within this molecule and throughout this reaction process. So the next step is the binding of carbon dioxide to this active site here. So with this hydroxide ion formation, the water molecule that began as a weak nucleophile is now a strong nucleophile. And our carbon dioxide is an electrophile, so a good uh, group for this nucleophile to attack. The oxygen that has a negative charge attacks the carbon of the carbon dioxide, and the carbon-oxygen double bond moves from here onto the oxygen, which will generate a negative charge on this oxygen here. This again is still bound to that zinc ion and the histidines holding it in place. In the next step, we have the conversion to hydrogen bicarbonate. So this occurs with, as we mentioned before, this oxygen has, is now bound to this carbon 
And this oxygen here has a negative charge, the one that is also bound to the carbon. This generates that hydrogen bicarbonate, but this is stabilized and held together through that zinc two plus ion. And the next step, we want that carbonic anhydrase to return to its original form in order to be reused. And we also want to now access this hydrogen bicarbonate. So to do this, we will regenerate the catalytic site through the release of this hydrogen bicarbonate and through the binding of water, which we can see here. So as this occurs, we have now regenerated our carbonic anhydrase. And instead of releasing CO2 into the blood, we now have generated this hydrogen bicarbonate that will be released and used in order to neutralize or change the pH in the body system. Next enzyme we're going to talk about is enolase, which is an example of a metallo enzyme. This is an enzyme that is used, it's a glycolytic enzyme that is used in gluconeogenesis. And it has an active site that contains two divalent metal ions, ions which are required for catalysis, which you can see here as two magnesium two plus ions. Here we have the beginning of the active site. We have a lysine 345 here, which hosts a, um, at, or will act as a general base. And then later on, we will talk about the glutamate here, glutamate 211, that will act as an acid. So first, this lysine 345 acts as a general base by attacking here this hydrogen and splitting this carbon-hydrogen bond. This will then generate a carb anion intermediate that is stabilized by those two magnesium ions in order to stabilize the negative charges as we now have two that are formed on these oxygens that are bound to this carbon. This is stabilized as a carboxylate and allows for the process of an acid reaction, acid catalyzed reaction from the glutamate to 11. So now we have the oxygen um, will donate a pair of electrons to regenerate that double bond here. This double bond from the carbon carbon will be moved to this next carbon carbon bond here. And this oxygen will donate its bond to this hydrogen here in order to generate a water molecule. This water molecule, this hydrogen that was now bound to this oxygen will donate its electrons to this oxygen here as an acid, which will then, as you can see here, form the final product, which is the phosphophenol pyruvate. And we have a new base, and a new acid that will be generated. Okay, yeah, so um, this is the mechanism for serine proteases. Uh, so serine proteases are chymotrypsin, enolase, and trypsin. They are enzymes that cleave peptides at the peptide bond, um, and their catalytic triad is uh, serine, histidine, and aspart aspartic acid. Um, so yeah, as you can see, our catalytic triad is here in gray and our substrate is in orange. Um, and yeah, so the first step is to start with uh, protonated serine and deprotonated histidine. Um, and then there will be a general base catalysis uh, and a nucleophilic attack on the carbonyl carbon of the substrate um, to form a tetrahedral intermediate, as you can see right here. Um, and then a general acid catalysis will break down the tetrahedral intermediate into the acyl enzyme intermediate and the no end terminus, which will be cleaved and it will be um, basically replaced by water, as you can see here. Um, so this is the no end terminus um, from the cleavage with the serine protease. And so water, it, which, like I mentioned, replaces the amine product um, once it is released, um, does a general base catalysis uh, and a nucleophilic attack to form, again, the tetrahedral intermediate um, with the acyl enzyme, from the acyl enzyme. Um, and then this is again the tetrahedral intermediate and then another general acid catalysis uh, breaks down this tetrahedral intermediate into the carboxyl product 
um, which is the new C terminus from the um, protease cleavage and uh, the active enzyme again. So as we can see here, the serine is once again protonated. Um, yeah, so that's the loop for um, serine proteases. Like I said, serine proteases are enolases, chymotrypsin, trypsin, all of that. Um, you can see the specific binding pockets in the lecture slides as well. Okay, yeah, and this is the mechanism for aspartoprotease. Um, so we have in the uh, in the enzyme we have the aspartic two aspartic acids. Uh, one is deprotonated as you can see here, and one is protonated as you can see here. Ah, um, so the deprotonated aspartic acid takes a hydrogen proton from water, which is found in the active site. Um, and again, our uh, substrate is going to be in orange. Um, so the water is already in the active site when uh, the reaction starts. So the deprotonated aspartic acid takes a uh, hydrogen proton from there, uh, from water, and then the resulting OH group will act as a nucleophile and cause an attack on um, the carbonyl carbon to make a tetrahedral intermediate right here. And then this bond is going to be cleaved uh, because uh, the nitrogen from the amine group will take uh, a hydrogen proton from the protonate from the now protonated aspartic acid and cleave the bond right there. And this will like come back down to reform uh, the carbonyl and break down the tetrahedral intermediate. And so yeah, it's that's the loop. So it in doing the in breaking this bond and taking out this hydrogen and putting back uh, and like breaking down the tetrahedral intermediate, you get the new C terminus right here and the new N terminus in one fell swoop. And then you have the reestablished active enzyme right here. So it's uh, basically hydrolysis mechanism right there. All right. So we're going to go over the mechanisms of cysteine proteases and RNase A. For an example of a cysteine protease, we have papine. It's frequently used as a meat tenderizer. It's found naturally in papaya plants. It's very, very, very similar to the serine protease mechanism. So if you know that one, this one's going to be a piece of cake. Over here at the top left, we have our active enzyme, and then we're going to have a peptide in here. Cysteine proteases don't generally display a lot of specificity, so there could be a number of R groups there um, that papain would cleave. So we have our histine residue deprotonated and our cysteine residue protonated. Uh, hydrogen bond between them, the cis, or this, excuse me, the histidine is going to take the proton from cysteine to activate the sulfur for nucleophilic, nucleophilic attack. So it'll go into the carbonyl carbon, goes up, and then you have your formation of your tetrahedral inter intermediate. You can see, first step exactly the same, just with cysteine instead of serine. Next up, we have the collapse of the tetrahedral intermediate. So this negative oxygen, the oxyanion, it's going to come back, reform your carbonyl, and then your X here, which will likely be the end side of your peptide, is going to take that proton from histidine and then leave the active site. And we replace by water. Sometimes this step is shown in two steps instead of one. So the first step being um, it leaving the active site and then water re-entering the active site, but I just showed it in one. And then you now have your deprotonated histidine, which is gonna take a proton from oxygen, uh, activating, or sorry, take a proton from water, activating the oxygen for nucleophilic attack, going to go reform, hit this acyl enzyme intermediate, exactly like we had 
in our serine proteases. And then we have another tetrahedral intermediate going, then have it collapse. So we have the oxy anion. It's going to come back, reestablish our carbonyl. And then um, this time, the electrons between the carbon and sulfur, they're going to go and it's going to retake the proton from histidine. That way we have the reformation of our active enzyme. And then we can see there at the end, we have our active enzyme exactly the same as we started with. And then we have our carboxyl group with the rest of the amino acid. There is the R. That's really it for cysteine proteases, ping pong mechanism, um, exactly the same as serine proteases. And so then the other one that I'm gonna go over is our, I'm trying to see if I can show it all in one. Apologize for that. Um, we're gonna go over RNSA. So it tends to be the cleavage of the phosphate to oxygen by prime bond of RNA after pyrimidine residue. So here at the start, we can see we have our, we have our RNA chain right here, we continue on there, continue on there. It's after pyrimidine, so this top base is either going to be a uracil or a, I'm blanking, whatever the C1 is. It's okay, we'll move on. Um, so on your mechanism, on your enzyme, you have two histines, which are really going to be you're in your active sites, you have histine 119 and histine 12. Histine 12 is going to start off deprotonated. Histine 119 is going to start off protonated. Um, so the way this mechanism goes, we have the uh, deprotonated nitrogen on histine 12. It's going to go and take that two prime, deprotonate the two prime uh, group on your RNA ribose sugar uh, so that that oxygen is then or activated for nucleophilic attack. It's going to go and attack the slightly more positively charged phosphate. And then I did show the intermediate stage here. Keep in mind, this is all one step. So this is a general acid base catalysis, not general base, then general acid. So we see here now the histine 119 acts as its general acid, uh, donates a proton here, and that's going to really cleave that uh, phosphate, the phosphate backbone. We have, we see that in here from the transition state to the final product or to the product of that step. Um, so after that, then we have the Formation of your intermediate, it's a cyclic 2,3 ribonucleotide phosphate. That's right here. Um, my histine 12 is a little bit far away from the active site in this picture, but that's all right. Let's get the idea. So water's now entered the active site. Uh, histine 119, it's going to go abstract a proton from water, activating it for nucleophilic attack. You know, hit that phosphate, bam. <laughs> um, then your carbonyl is going to deform, reform. And then that two prime oxygen, that one's going to go out and take the proton from histine 12. Uh, so it's acting, histine 12 then is acting as a general acid. It's a pretty simple hydrolysis for that step. And then very simple, we have our reestablished enzyme. We have our histine 119 down here, our histine 12 up at the top. And then these would be your two products, we see the cleaved RNA backbone.